You're in a good place now. You are listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Liquor True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Joining me this evening is a good friend of mine, somebody I respect and admire, Chris Howe. Chris Howe has a communications firm, a PR media, digital marketing, and event services firm. They do a lot of problem solving, and there's a lot of creativity involved. Chris, I'm so glad you're here to join me live on Live Your True Life Perspectives. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. I've always wanted to be on your show, so I'm excited about being here. Well, I am glad to have you on the show. I have been on your show, and I uh, really enjoyed myself, and it was a lot of fun. And I want to talk to you first off about a little bit about your background, because I think what you do is very interesting, and I know you work with both, you know, for-profit and non-for-profit. Tell me how you got into the industry. Well, it started out for me really as a uh, radio news reporter. I uh, had the opportunity to work for a local uh, uh, radio station in Dallas as a news reporter for them for about seven years, and in that process, had the opportunity to help organizations to tell their stories, to really kind of shape how uh, the public view them. So it was in that process that I thought, you know, I'd like to continue this. So when the opportunity at the radio station ended, I then formed my own company. It's Chris Howell Communications. And as you stated, uh, we uh, help organizations and individuals tell their story. That's awesome. What are some of the most fun uh, clients that you've worked with? Some of the most fun clients that I've had the opportunity to work with, I guess, would really be when we have the opportunity to work with uh, Motive Entertainment. They are based in uh, California, and we had the opportunity to work on a couple of uh, movie projects for them. They do a lot of grassroots uh, marketing for uh, faith-based films, Mm -hmm. and we had the opportunity to work on uh, Little Boy. Uh, the Good Lie, and uh, the latest one was Ben Hur. So we had the opportunity to go down to Houston to do a, a red carpet premiere, and you had to see this. Not only, you know, typically premieres take place in L.A. This particular premiere was in Houston, so it was the opportunity for Houston, who's who of Houston, to come together with who's who of L.A., uh, Mark Burnett, Roma Downey, uh, Joel Osteen, his wife, and some other folks were in attendance there, and to just see that type of energy that normally has to take place in L.A. to take place in Houston, it was very exciting for us, and we were able to capture that, put together a uh, recap of video for them to show uh, all of the things that took place in that setting, and it was, it was a lot of fun. That's neat. I love uh, film premieres. You know, some people say, uh, you know, why do you love them so much? I just like being in the, it's like you're in the moment. It's almost like being at a concert. Absolutely. And you might not always love what the band plays at the concert, but you were there live. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. And you know, one of the things like like that is that it's been a lot of hard work and dedication and and money and energy and things been tied to the project to make the project happen. So it's almost like being at the birthing of a baby. You know, now everyone's coming, you know, for this baby to be birthed to see, you know, how the uh, public is going to receive it so it's always exciting to see that I love that. And I love when things come to fruition, too. It's always nice to see things yep. actually take place. So let me ask you, where are some of the places that you traveled um, doing this work? Because I know that you traveled quite extensively. I've had the opportunity to uh, go to Winnipeg, Canada. I've had the opportunity to go to Honduras, uh, India, uh, New Delhi, India, and had the opportunity to, uh, of course, now personal travel, of course, uh, a three-month project that my wife does. She's a, a medical consultant. She, a project was going to take about three months, ended up being a two-year project. So we basically this past couple of years, basically lived in Hawaii, huh. uh, going back and forth, uh, working with her on that project. Oh, that's nice. Yep. So, I mean, it's the hard life living in Hawaii. It's I'm telling so you, it was hard. extremely tough. I mean, you know, the eight hour, eight and a half hour plane ride going back and forth out there. I mean, man, nobody wants to do that. Yeah, but it's like the intermediate. It's between those flights, you know. I saw some of the pictures. I remember you sent me some of the pictures on. Oh, you're talking on, about the one me surfing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, it was like you surfing, or there was like pineapples and pina coladas, and like. Wait a minute, oh, not in, not in the same picture though. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying when I hit the water, the pineapples and everything started flying out. Here's a 240 pound black guy surfing. Yes, we do surf. <laughs> You're like, yes, we do. I'm, I'm breaking the MythBusters right now. We do surf. Absolutely. Do you like to surf? Uh, that was the one and only time, and I'd like to try it again. Yeah. Yes, that's cool. I respect. <laughs> I would that. like to try it again. I haven't been that uh, that advent- uh, that adventurous, really. Honestly, I, I find that hard to believe because I mean, you, just listening to you and uh, talking with you, you sound like a pretty adventurous person. I am, but the surfing thing. I mean, there's a, that's a lot going on. I mean, you're you're going out in the water and you're waiting around for a wave, and then you get this wave and you you paddle really fast, and it, it's it's a lot of work. Yeah, you, you know what? Actually, when you say that, and I know you you'll appreciate this because. I have often thought what type of message I could speak on from that lesson because I had an instructor out there with me and he would tell me, no, let that wave pass you by. 
Okay, go for this one. Go for this one. And I think that's a lot like life. There are opportunities that come your way in life, and you don't want to jump on every one of them because it may look like the right opportunity, but it's not always the case. You have to wait for the right one. And uh, I, I know you'll t- probably take that, and you'll develop a message around Love that someday. That. <laughs> you see my wheels moving. You're I like, saw oh, that. Oh, yeah. Lord, eh? You're like, here comes the gerbils right out here on the wheel. <laughs> no, but it's true. You're right. It's like a lot of times we have that tendency, and I like to, I'd like to go into that right now. We have that tendency of when somebody comes to us about something, and, and I think there's three different, let's talk about three different waves, right? Uh-huh. You have that wave, which is like, uh, you know, oh, hey, help me do this or get involved with this, and it has nothing to do with you. Yeah. And haven't you had that tendency to sit there and go, you okay? You know, and then when I back up nowadays, I back up and I go, wait a second, okay, how did I just get into this? Or why is this even a part of my duty? Yeah. And then I realize a lot of times it's my ego that wants to jump in and, and save the day, yes. you know? Yes, yes. You know, and it's not just you. I think we're all that way because we have people that are in our lives for one reason or another, and we care about them. So when we they have a situation or a problem, we want to jump in and help them out. But again, we have to understand that just because we're talented and gifted to be able to do a lot of things doesn't mean that we have to try to do everything. And I am personally uh, doing an inventory of how I uh, take on uh, assignments and uh, opportunities because I don't want to try to be involved with everything. I'm reading the book, The One Thing, and it's uh, really helped me to understand that really you have to hone in and throw all of your energy behind that one thing. And right now that is our company moving that company forward. And that's going to then open up the opportunity for so many other things. That's neat because I I think oftentimes we all get scared because we have had a little regret in our life and we didn't follow something. And I don't know if that's always the truth. You know, sometimes I think it's, we don't follow it for a reason, but I think we still beat ourselves up over it. And I think that oftentimes in those situations, when somebody comes with us with a deal or, or anything, we sit there, I better, I better listen to this. I better look into this. And now you're right. I've been recently in the last two years saying no. I mean, I really appreciate it, but I'm not interested. It should be for somebody else. I just don't have the amount of time to, to adequately, you know, give to that. And it's not really my deal. It's not really where I want to go. Right. So you're really focusing on one thing. That's it. I mean, because I used to think I really used to have a hard time and a challenge with understanding why someone would say no to an opportunity, because I thought if you had Let's say you had the time to do it. So I thought if you have the time to do it, you should do it. But I'm really beginning to understand now that I need to block off certain hours and time of the day to where I just really don't do anything. But think about the next move that I need to make. So it's not now I have to understand that I'm, when I prioritize my time, I really don't have the time to do it. But I used to think, well, I've got a free hour. I could go to a luncheon and I can hear a, hear a presentation or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. No, that's an hour now where I take and I'm actually, if I don't sit, but sit in my office and look out the window and process what I, the next move that I need to make, then that's the time that I'm investing in my own business and in myself, as opposed to giving it towards something that I'm not really interested in. That's that's neat. I think a lot of uh, our listeners can connect with that because oftentimes I find, you know, whether you're, you know, working two jobs, whether you're a stay at home mom, whatever it is, I think oftentimes we bite off more than we can chew. And then we kind of get a little angry about it. And I don't know about you, but I've been in that position where I have decided, OK, yes, I'll, I'll do that. And somebody asked me if I can do something. And certainly I said, OK, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, you know, and then I, I show up. And it's a hundred million times harder than what they told me. <laughs> and there's a thousand people standing there waiting for me to do something when I thought there was going to be 10 people and it all needed to be done four hours ago. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what have I signed up for? But I can't leave because I, I'm a, I'm a straight up person. I'm going to do what I say. But oftentimes we miss the boat because we don't ask the right questions. Right. We don't ask all the questions we want because we want to, we want to people please too though. Right. I think us humans have a tendency of doing that ever since we were a child. Right. You know what? I think that's part of it. And I guess you, you, you're you absolutely right. You get yourself in a situation and then you're regretting it and you're feeling bad about it because, like you said, you're going to honor your commitment to your commitment. So you're going to stay there, but you're really kicking yourself the entire time thinking, why did I allow this to happen to me again? <laughs> because it's happened to you before. So why did this? Uh, why did I allow this to happen to me again? But here's what I'm also starting to do. And I really hope your listeners you know my heart. I really hope that your listeners can hear my heart in this as well, not sound like some conceited guy or something. <laughs> but I am really starting to just evaluate where I am in life and really starting to ask the question when I'm asked to do things. I do ask the question now, what's in it for me? Mm-hmm. And I, I've never been that way in my life. And because I was never that way, I would allow myself to continually get in situations that I would then regret. But when someone comes to me with something now, if I then ask the question, what's in it for me? 
It gives me the opportunity to truly process it and understand whether or not I have within me what I need to give to that situation. And in return, will I actually get what I need out of that situation to help move what I'm trying to do forward as well? And when I take it through that process, it it allows me to easily say no to opportunities that really don't uh, allow me to be 100 percent to it or give me what I need in return. That's interesting. No, and I, I've always known you as, as a person that has a really good heart and somebody that's really down to earth, and, and that's awesome. And I think oftentimes we don't think about that because we think, oh, well, that's selfish, but it really isn't because if there's not really something that propels you forward toward your purpose or towards your direction, then are you doing it for the right reasons? Man. Would somebody else have come in and done a better job because it is on their purpose? And are we thinking that we're saving the day when in reality what we're doing is getting off base, getting off target, and then somebody else could have done the job and they might have propelled into their purpose when we basically just kind of mucked everything up. Yeah. Yeah, I like the way you put that because you're absolutely right. I mean, it's just it's one of those things where you get to you, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm over the hill or something. I'm 42 years old. But at the same time, you still evaluate your time and you evaluate, you know, uh, your legacy. And you're at this point, you start thinking about these are those years where you really have to start making a, a mark. And so you have to evaluate where you spend your time, where you spend your energy and what things you allow to even come into your space. I love that. I love that. I think everybody listening also, when you think about it, where in your life right now are you dealing with the situation? Where in your life right now are you spread too thin? And, and I think when you analyze that right now, take the moment right now, like Chris was talking about, like looking out the window, if you're driving, if you're sitting at the office, if you're at home making dinner. And really focus on that because that's really important. And I think that we try to do everything. And when we try to do everything, we don't do anything really that good. And so we're kind of spread thin. We're kind of in a bad mood. And then we look at ourselves and we think, well, what have I done to better my life? Yep. And then we kind of do things out of an anger. And and I remember a long time ago, you'll, you'll get a you'll get a uh, you'll get a, a laugh out of this, Chris. You'll get a laugh at it. Uh-huh. This is a long time ago. This was about. I guess this was before I was even married, so I would say this was like 13, 14 years ago or something like that. And I remember um, I was asked to photograph a wedding. And so I was like, this is great. And it was the pre-wedding before they went to Hawaii. So I was doing the big party. And uh-huh. there's like, the mayors of a couple of cities there. And there's all these people. And so I was like, perfect. And, they, and so about a week before, they said, if you can put up some of your artwork. Because I used to be a photographer in another life, you know. Okay. Um, so on the side, I used to be a professional photographer years and years and years ago when I was working through college and putting myself through college. Okay. So I hung up all this stuff at their house days before. Uh-huh. And I remember I went and got extra frames. And I spent money on my own pocket to do this, right? And yes. so I remember I showed up the night of it. And I looked at the guy that was getting married and I'm like hey you know and he was like I was like hey can we talk a second I was like I know you said you're gonna go on and pay me you can just pay me half right now and then when I get the everything back in you know after your wedding then you can just pay me the other half he's like oh um um so cash I'm like cash is fine check is fine cash or check is fine yeah. I'm like, well I don't have Either cash way. and I go okay what about check? I don't know where my checkbook is and I remember I kind of looked around and I went Mm-hmm. And I wanted to leave, but unfortunately, because of my ethics, yes, my ethics, um, I didn't. And no, I did not get paid. And yes, I had to actually almost, you know, basically say, I will come to your house with the police to get my pieces of work if you yes. do not let me in. And I realized right then and there, honestly, you have to really understand who are you dealing with and what's their values. Yes. And I think that when you're conscious of that, too, and it's not just about the money, okay? The money is just like, it's basically an exchange of goods, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, if I'm seeing somebody as a therapist, what comes back, like, for me, like you were saying, what, what do I get out of it? I'm helping right. them. How do I get something out of right. it? Right. And so that was interesting. And I learned a lot about that because I realized that my self-esteem wasn't where it needed to be and my acceptance of myself wasn't needed where it needed to be. Otherwise, I would never have been in that position. Man, that is so true. I mean, you know, everything that you just described there is, is if you I mean, for those of the listeners that are entrepreneurs have probably been in that situation at some point. Uh, but it's when you begin to value the product that you have and the service that you have to offer that you will then demand an agreement, a written agreement, and then you will demand a deposit for your work. And yes, you were fair with him. You said, I'll collect the rest of it when I bring you back the you know, finished photographs. And that's understandable. But to think that you're not going to give me a deposit for my work. No, that's just not going to happen. It was a learning experience for you, but I know today you would never allow that to happen again oh, because Chris. of that one experience. Oh, so, Chris, it was, it was a learning experience. experience. It was a big time. <laughs> 
when we return, we're we'll be talking more about learning experiences, how we overcame that, um, some stuff that Chris is working on. Also, we'll be talking later on in the hour about his nonprofit, which I want to talk about that as well. So stay tuned because Live Your True Life Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess. We'll be back this time. We'll be back this time. And oh, come on. You know this already. We'll be back this time in two shakes. Jump in the deep end on perspectives. Now, here's Ashley. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. And I'm Chris Howe. I'm your guest, Chris Howe. And this is my guest, Chris Howe. I <laughs> love it. Chris is awesome. Chris and I have known each other for a long period of time, and I'm always impressed by our ability to have an amazing conversation. I mean, seriously, we, we can converse on almost anything. Yep. I mean, because you're so well versed. I mean, you know just everything. So you. <laughs> it, gives, it makes for a great conversation. You know, we know everything. I don't know everything. I just try to hang out with people like Ashley that does. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. We were talking before the break. We were talking about the waves of life. And, you know, Chris was talking about when he was learning how to surf in Hawaii and how really, honestly, like his, uh, you know, his coach or his uh, his surfing, what, what do you call it? He was a surfing coach? instructor. Surfing yeah, instructor. Yeah, he was teaching the lessons out there for like, what, 45 bucks a while, uh, an hour or something. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I only spent an hour at 45 <laughs> bucks. <laughs> You're like, now I need to go have a Mai Tai, please. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> now, seriously, though, and he, he said, don't take some of the waves. He's like, well, wait out on that wave or wait. And it's interesting how you, you were thinking about how that's like life and that is really neat and that really applies to i think most of the people listening to this show is that oftentimes i mean it's almost like playing a softball game where you go after every one of them some of them are in the dirt some of them are over your head some of them hit you in the arm and you're like why am i doing this i mean you know when something comes clear in and makes you know you see it and you can see it come in that's usually the sign of something that has potential absolutely and you know the other thing is yeah i like your uh, softball analogy if you're swinging at everything you won't have the energy to make the run once you actually connect something. So you really have to make sure that you're not swinging at everything so that when you do get that one thing that you've been designed and created to do, you have the energy to run the race to see that to, through to completion. That's so true. And, and I think oftentimes, like, we're just so scared of, of, of regret. And But then you have the other side of the coin. You have people that, uh, unfortunately, and I've been there before, where you just don't do you know, where you get stuck in non-movement, where we sit there and we watch every wave, we watch every ball come over that plate, yeah, yeah. and we stand there and watch. And then later on we say, well, life's been passing me by. And I think that's based on the fact that it's you're too scared to get in. You're too yeah. scared to get into the game of life because what if something happens? What if you get told no? What if it doesn't work out? And instead of... I don't think there's any failure when you actually try. Right. But instead of having that failure feeling, you're like, well, I just don't want to deal with it at all. Man. You know, I, I will tell you, I used to be one of those people. I was always I was always afraid of failure. And I thought, man, I do not want to fail. I don't want to try because I don't want to fail. That whole thing you just talked about. And I heard someone say one day that you will never really experience success until you're not afraid to fail. And man, that just really just resonated with me. And I thought, you know what? That is true. I'm never going to really get good at it until I do it. So I was, uh, it reminds me also of something that Les Brown says. He talks about the fact that uh, you don't have to be great to get started, but in order to become great, you have to start. I love that. Yeah. So it's just, I mean, take the brakes off to the person who's listening today who's thinking, you know what? That resonates with me. Take the brakes off. I mean, get out there and get started. You may fail, but you know what? If you don't succeed the first time, try and try again. And it's through the process of trying that you begin to learn how to do it and do it better. And then ultimately you have the success that you desire. I love that. And I think, you know, I think that's the problem, too, in our society today is that we see we look up to a lot of folks that have done a lot of things and everybody kind of gets scared. Well, I I don't have that same worth. And I think it goes back to value. And I think when I was growing up, I had I think I had a small I didn't have an adequate self value. Yeah. And I didn't see it. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of things in my way from seeing that. And I think a lot of people go through that. And that's why we, we look down upon ourselves. That's why we want to try to change everything. Yeah. That's why we can't accept what we consider not that good you know, sides of ourselves. Like, for example, you know, I have clients that come into my office all the time that literally like, well, look at this. And my hair looks like crap. And my job is this way. And I have a pimple on my face. And how can I love that? I'm like, well, you have to. Yeah. I mean, because if you don't love that, it, it's not about being perfect. I mean, there comes a time when we realize that once we begin to love what we have, all of a sudden we begin to see the beauty in that. Then we get to love that, and then we turn around and realize the beauty in others and love that, and we're not so judgmental and hard on other people. Man, 
And that is so true. It's really about the message that you're telling yourself and how you talk to yourself and the messages that you're surrounding yourself with. So I'm glad you're listening to Ashley's show because, again, Ashley's going to give you that positive information and that positive reinforcement that we all need. And I think you, you to take it even further, each morning when I get up, one of the things that I'm doing now and have been doing now for the last ooh, maybe six months or so is that every morning I get up, before I start jumping on Facebook and social media and all those other different places, I actually go through a process of reading my Bible, first of all. And then the other thing is I actually start listening to positive messages. It's that, and I listen to some of the same messages over and over. It's either Les Brown or Zig Ziglar, John Maxwell, some of those guys just giving me that positive reinforcement. So when I go out and face today, I've come in with a foundation built already. So no matter what comes my way, I've actually got something to fight back with. I love that. Yeah. That's smart. It, It works for me. Because I've I've tried it the other way. <laughs> I've tried it the other way where you get out of bed and you literally, it's immediate. And you go, you get out of bed, you, you grab the phone and you're, yeah. you're, you're in the dark Mm-mm. basically. And you're looking at social media. And one time it was funny, I dropped my phone on my nose and almost broke it. But anyway, oh. you know, I was like, oh. That should make you never do that again. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I was pretty funny. Uh, and there was somebody else that had done it the same day and they actually broke their nose. But anyway, I, I lucked out. But it was funny though because I was watching everybody on Instagram and, and I was looking at this and I was looking at that and I started like downplaying my own life. Yeah. You're comparing yourself to others. Oh man, their life is so wonderful. No, they're just showing you the wonderful moments. Exactly. <laughs> You're not seeing behind the scenes. And how many times did it take them to, sh- to shoot that one shot? You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'll equate it to this. It's just like me on the surfboard. If you see that photo that the guy was, the man is a snap within that ten, ten, I, a tenth of a second. Mm-hmm. I can't think of what it would probably be. He, you look like I look like I'm surfing, man. I look like I know what I'm doing. And the next shot, I'm going face down into the water. <laughs> So, I mean, don't compare yourself to others because, again, that was just a photo snapped in that moment. And you've it's got a great moment, your- though. It's a great moment. It really was. It really was. I mean, I've got that on my screensaver on my computer because, I mean, it's a moment that I'll probably never have again. That's I don't cool, know. though. Well, I, I had the same type of moment years ago when I was on the Matterhorn and, and I, I didn't want to ski and I said I wasn't going to ski. And then somebody talked me into it. And uh, anyway, they got me uh, somebody to coach me how to do it. I remember there's like two or three shots I have that makes me look really, really cool. Yeah. <laughs> But I was terrified. Yeah. I mean, I was like, I haven't even had back surgery yet. I have back surgery coming up. I'm terrified. I mean, if I fall, I mean, I'm not getting off this mountain on my own, you know? Man, you just said something, though. You felt the fear, but you did it anyway. Did it anyway. That's another thing that I said tell people to the person who's not, you know, getting started, to the person who's too afraid, who's too nervous, who think they don't have what it takes to get going. Feel the fear. Do it anyway. Get out there and Love do it anyway. That. You did it. You, you felt did. the fear, but you did it anyway. And now you've got that picture to, that doesn't show ex- any type of fear at all it just shows you doing your thing just crazy all it says is crazy I'm just I'm just seriously it's like what i mean i was like oh my god i can't believe i'm doing this but it all worked out and you're right it all worked out and i think and i think we have to overcome that fear yeah. and you know i know you would know this better than 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 most people is that usually when we want to overcome fear what's the best way we do we deal with it we help other people yep Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I've always done. I really have always tried to anything that I've ever done. I've tried to volunteer to do it uh, first and a to help others and B to gain the experience in that area and then to be able to evaluate whether or not it really is truly something that I desire to do, whether it's speaking, whether it's video production or whatever it is that we do. Uh, I've always volunteered to do it first. That's awesome. Yeah, helping someone else. When did you first start volunteering? When you were like five? Or <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. Old. I I guess first started volunteering at roughly about uh, maybe fifteen, fifteen, sixteen years old. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because at that point, I was then trying to figure out, still trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do when I became an adult, you know? So I thought, let me volunteer in some areas and kind of try out a few things and see what sticks. What were some of the things that you volunteered um, back then, I mean, doing? At the time, it was actually volunteering at my church, uh, helping to, you know, I guess serve as an usher at the church as a volunteer to go up and help painting when they needed painting and, you know, different things like that. Uh, In the community, it was uh, any organization, it was like uh, sports programs, if they had a sports program and they need someone just to carry the bag for the players because I couldn't play any sports at all. I never played any sports. I uh, don't really understand them, but I, really? was there. I, I don't. I, you know, I had kids at a very early age. Okay. So I had my first kid when I was 16 years old. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So when it was an opportunity to go and maybe just help out with the players and help them, you know, meet their needs or whatever, it was doing things like that. That's cool. Yeah. That's neat. But it, it gave you a heart. It gave you, I guess I've always had a, uh, what you would refer to as a servant's heart. Yeah. yeah, the opportunity to serve others. So that's why I wanted to make sure I made that distinguishing point early on a moment ago that. I don't, this new way of evaluating things is not some conceited or selfish type person. It's just that I have to really evaluate my time. 
Well, I agree with you. And, and I think that when you are giving your time, that's awesome. But it's also important to feel good about your purpose. Yeah. And, and I think purpose does come from serving others to some degree. I think that there's a, f- a facet of all of our purposes. Like, you know, part of what I'm doing is to help people understand who they are, to be able to figure out who they are authentically, how to get past the stuff that they were taught by, you know, most of them are or family that was trying to be helpful, you know, but they didn't know any better. They knew what they knew. And so they taught that. And so getting people out of that mind thought, if they were around um, negative or abusive families, being able to get out of that mind thought and being able to see themselves or who they really are. Yeah. And that's one, something that I'm working with to do. And I think it's important. And that has a, that has a great payout for these people in the end, because I help people and they get help and then they can also, you know, stop the cycle. Right. And so like, t- tell me a little bit about your, um, well, actually when we come back, when we, when we come back from break, I want you to begin tell, talking about your nonprofit, okay because i want to hear more about that and i want to hear about how you got into that okay good deal so stay tuned live your true life perspectives chris howell is joining me we'll be back here and just we'll be back in two shakes this is jake Busey, and you're listening to perspectives with ashley burgess Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Joining me this evening in studio is Chris Howell, and Chris Howell is a great friend of mine. He runs a communications firm. They do both PR, digital marketing, um, problem-solving, creativity, but he was also a broadcast personality, an MC, a speaker, an author, everything. On top of that, he runs a nonprofit. And Chris, tell me a little bit more about the nonprofit that we were talking about right before the break. Absolutely. It's the Chris Howell Foundation, again, based here in Dallas as well, and And with the Chris Howell Foundation, Ashley, I have always wanted to do something regarding HIV and AIDS. My brother passed away in 2006 due to complications of HIV and AIDS. So uh, I I always wanted to do something but didn't really have a platform or an opportunity to do anything. But this uh, past year, uh, we started looking at ways where we can do something because we have a a video production company. We started looking at ways where we can at least help start getting messaging out there to make folks aware that the epidemic has not uh, lessened any. In, cra- in fact, it's even, I want to say it's worse than what it, what it was before, but the numbers of new infection rates have not decreased. Really? No, not at all. And particularly in Dallas County, Dallas County has led the state of Texas in new HIV infections for the past five years. Whoa. Think about that. Dallas, Texas. <laughs> what about state-wise, um, you know, in, in, in this country, what are like the, the three... Do you know anything about the states, about the largest growth of AIDS in in the United States? You know what? I don't know exactly what state would be the leading state. I do know that Dallas County is leading the state of Texas for the last five years. So our focus has been on trying to really help to decrease the number of new infection rates in Dallas County. Uh, And one of the ways we're doing that is we're actually putting out video messaging. The other thing we're doing is we're actually holding events. And in those events, we're not just having folks to come in to be tested, but we're also allowing for folks to come in and receive education. So we'll have a a panel. Panel discussion, and in that panel discussion, it's typically a doctor of some sort. Uh, it's someone who's an HIV advocate who's sharing their story, and then it's typically someone who's positive who's talking about how they are living with the effects of HIV. Because understanding what I, my family went through when my brother uh, passed away with it, I want to make sure that no other family, first of all, let me back up a moment. With my brother, I didn't have the type of relationship with him that I should have had before he passed because mm-hmm. I was ignorant. And I had kids and thought, you know what, I don't want to go around him. I don't want to contract something. And then to my kids and all those type of things, because at the time, you know, the whole myths about you can uh, catch HIV from shaking someone's hand or drinking out of their drink and all those type of things that I was just totally ignorant on. I, it kept me away from him. So I want to help to educate families and folks to understand that, that none of those things are true, that you can have a family member who is positive and you can still love on that family member and not contract HIV. And to the person who is HIV positive, helping them to understand that they can have a whole and healthy life if, in fact, they do the things they need to do to take care of themselves. And the other thing is, again, folks who don't know their status, we're holding those Know Your Status Dallas events so folks can begin to go out, get tested, know your status, know the status of the person that you're being intimate with. Because I have so many times we've talked to individuals who have contracted the virus from someone who knowingly had the virus. That person knew they had it, but they didn't tell this person that they had it. For whatever reason, they didn't tell. There's a lady that we interviewed who married a gentleman. They met. They married nine months later on their one year anniversary. She got the results, test results, learning that she was HIV positive. She's now been positive for 17 years. This gentleman was positive. He knew that he was positive 14 years before he ever met her. 
He just never told her. He never showed any signs until after they were married. Then he became ill. He goes, she takes him to the hospital and learns at that time that he, in fact, is HIV positive. What happened to them? She's still living. I mean, like I said, she's been uh, 17 years positive now. I don't know anything about him, and she doesn't know anything about him. I guess after their divorce and separation, she's not sure you know, what happened to him. Mm-hmm. But she's still living. In fact, now she is an HIV advocate. And her her testimony and her video is on our website. It's Edith Lewis, and that's the interview with Edith Lewis that's on our website. And after hearing her story, that's what actually compelled us to start the foundation, to think we really have to do more than just video messaging. We have to get out into the community to actually help spread the awareness. I have some friends, some very close, close friends of mine who are HIV positive mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and, 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 so, and they've, they've had a tough time of it, a tough road of it. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. I mean, they're, they're on, you know, they take their medication and they follow their protocol and they look fine. They look, yeah. you know, they look totally healthy, right. but you don't really think about that oftentimes. And, you know, I, I feel like the media and the news has been kind of downplaying that maybe. Right. Because you don't ever hear about it. Well, and that's the thing. Because you don't hear about it, people tend to let their guard down, and they don't think about it as much. When we were getting inundated with messaging, you know, 15 years ago, it was at the top of everyone's mind. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our job now as a foundation to really try and continue that awareness because the news is not doing their part of making us aware of it. Organizations like ours are hoping we can keep the messaging out in our circles, then those folks will then take it to others, and we'll continue to do it uh, maybe from a more uh, grassroots standpoint. You know, it's interesting. I've been working with some clients recently, actually some female clients who, you know, have been having a difficult time dating people and thinking that they're cheating and all this kind of stuff. And I said, you know, why do you why do you feel this way? And, you know, they they, they tell you all this other stuff. And then finally I said, are you having unprotected sex with them? Oh, yes. I said, so what if you started having protected sex with them? Would it scare you a lot then at that point in time that they might be seeing someone else? Well, no, not really. Don't you think that for your own health and well-being and the respect of your own body? I mean, because it kind of goes both ways. Right. I mean, if somebody came to me and said, oh, let's have sex, you know, and I wasn't obviously married for, you know, and I said, okay, and they like, I don't want to use protection. Well, wouldn't you start thinking, um, okay, yeah. don't you kind of question that? Do they do this with everybody? And the flip side is, is that when a woman agrees to it? Or your whoever agrees yeah. to it. I mean, it's you got to really think about that. And I think that oftentimes people live in the moment, and they don't realize, okay, I'm going to have to deal with this moment, for right. maybe for a very long time. Lifelong consequences behind right. that, behind that one moment, oh. you know. And I guess the one, and that's what you've just talked about there from the female perspective. Uh, we are really trying to help to really educate women, even on the female condom. Yeah. There are so many women when you mention the female condom, and they're like, "I never even heard of it." <laughs> It's like, really? You never even heard of it. So it's really trying to educate and really not only educate, but empower women to understand that you can take advantage of that situation. If you're going to be going on a date with someone and you know there's a good chance that you're going to be intimate, you could actually place the female condom on hours before you actually become intimate. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, those type of things that people just don't know. So there's so many opportunities out there to prevent you from becoming HIV positive. But again, you have to, first of all, value who you are Mm -hmm. and protect yourself. If you're going to be intimate with someone, use protection. Because like the thing you talked about a moment ago, I mean, infidelity is something that's always been there. But I mean, you know, now it seems like with, I don't know, with the the, uh, Internet and, and temptation and all these different dating sites and things of that nature, you have people who have multiple partners. Mm-hmm. And when you, if you contract something, if you got multiple partners, you don't know who you got it from. If you're not using protection with either of them, well, you're right. And there's a lot of different dating sites out there. And you know, what, one of the things that I've been talked to about a lot of, you know, from clients who are married when they catch the the husband. Or they find the wife yeah. uh, under a different name on, you know, uh, various tenders and various different applications. Yeah. And you don't know what's really happening. Right. And, and, I, and if you're not willing to go, go go to the plate and get the test done together, right. you know, and you all wait then, then you need to do what's second best, you know, and that's protection. And, and, and otherwise, and, and I think it all comes back to, like you said, is respecting your body and yeah. respecting yourself and, and, and caring about the fact that there's a purpose and that you're supposed to carry out a purpose and that if, if something happens to you before that, then you've kind of have not made this reality happen. Absolutely. And I will tell you, Ashley, one of the things I mean, your listeners are likely adults and they understand this, what we're talking about. But the thing that's really alarming and disturbing for us is that one of the fastest growing populations right now of new HIV infections is that age group of 13 to 24. Mm-hmm. So these are young people that are, you know, having parties and things of that nature where they're engaging in unprotected sex at 13 years old and becoming HIV positive. 
Wow. So for the parents that are listening, I mean, it's important that you understand what it is your young people are engaged in and have that conversation. If you've not had that conversation of protected uh, protection and all those things that go along with the consequences of unprotected sex, it's time to have that conversation. I mean, you know, Johnny and, and, you know, David and our little boys and our little girls are, you know, they may be innocent and they mean well, but they may get into a situation where the peer pressure, things of that nature overcome them. They find themselves in a compromised position and then have life long consequences as a result of it. Wow. I never even thought about that. Yeah, it's happening. I mean, the numbers show it nationally. Wow. Ages 13 to 24, one of the fastest growing populations. Wow. Oh, my gosh. I never even thought about that. I mean, Chris, that's... that's, that's... Well, I had my first kid at 16. I mean, so I I understand it. I get it. I mean, it's not hard for me to understand that because, you know, my, my first sexual experience is at nine years old. So it's not hard for me to understand that. I mean, I thankfully I didn't have any lifelong consequences as a result of it. Right. But uh, you know, it's one of those things now where you try to help them to understand. Hopefully, if they know better, they will do better. That's so true. That is so true. When we return, we'll be talking about motivation, about direction, about what's happening with Chris here in the future, and we'll be talking more about that when we return. Absolutely. Stay tuned because Live Your True Life Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Bird, will be back this time. Be back this time in two shakes. Get in here. You're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Tonight, Chris Howell has been joining me in studio, and right now, I want to talk about motivation. I think what you've been doing for you know, to help uh, expound people's minds on HIV and really educate people is amazing. What gets you, though, to motivate yourself every day? What are some of the words that you say to yourself? What are some of the comments? What are some of the images and symbols that you think about uh, when you wake up in the morning? I think the thing that I think about first and foremost is my family. Uh, you know, my success that I, the success that I desire to have, it really is truly to make sure that I leave uh, a strong and a wealth and all those things for my family. I was about to say a strong legacy and uh, the wealth and all those things that I desire. I desire to leave those for my uh, family. I have a six year old grandson and I really want to make sure that uh, he kisses my picture every day and say, Grandpa, I really love you and I love the things that you left for me. That's that's one of my dreams anyway. But that motivates me. It motivates me to get out every day to really be the best person that I can be, first of all, uh, to represent them well, to make sure that I don't do anything that's going to embarrass them. Uh, The other thing is it motivates me to again try and go out there to obtain the wealth and the success and all the things that I would like to leave for them. That's, That's awesome. Important. The process happens, though, because I get up every morning and I, again, I read my Bible. I read the Proverbs every, Proverbs every day. And then the second thing is, again, it's positive messages. Before I start checking email, before I start listening or getting on Facebook, it's listening to positive messages that help me to reinforce who I am because I believe that I am a communicator and I believe I'm a great communicator. And those I have some of those things on my mirror. Actually, I have mm-hmm. notes on my mirror. I'm a great communicator. I'm a loving husband. I'm a doting grandfather. And uh, I'm a, a uh, pillar in my community are some of the things I have on my mirror. Oh, I like that. I have a mantra on my mirror, too. Uh, I actually had to rewrite it the other day because I realized that my um, my penmanship was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, mine is scribbled out. But I probably should have typed it, but, hey, you know, I can read it. When you can't see your own affirmations, you're like, well, what is that? I mean, <laughs> Oh, this, this doggone print can't even write, can't even read anything. Uh, I'm a great talk show host. I just can't write for anything. I'm seriously like chicken scratch. Like, it's like I'm good at. <laughs> you know the funny part is I can see you're really doing that. I'm like, um, um, okay, <laughs> make it up as you go. I gotta come back to that one tomorrow. I don't know what I am on that one. I'm good at everything. <laughs> I am in the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think about that kind of stuff. You know, it's funny how that goes. But so, let me ask you also: What are some of the things that you're thinking about doing in the future? Do you have some things that you really want to pursue? Some, you know, like the you know, I, I don't like the word bucket list. I really don't like that because it, it has some negative connotation. Are there some things that you want to check off on the Chris Howell list here in the next year that are just really, really, you're just kind of chomping at the bit to to make it happen a reality? You know what? I I really don't have a whole list of things. I mean, I guess from a professional standpoint, there are some people. I've had the opportunity to interview some wonderful people. Uh, I've interviewed Zig Ziglar, John Maxwell, uh, T. 
T.D. Jakes, Joel Osteen, some of those guys. Me. But I, you, absolutely, <laughs> Ashley Burgess, you better believe it. And it's just, but I, there are still some people that I would like to interview. I would like to, for whatever reason, here late, as of late, I've really been thinking I'd like to interview Serena Williams. Mm. And the interview really wouldn't even be around tennis. I mean, it would really be about who she is as an individual. Anytime I interview somebody, I like to really learn more about who they are as an individual. Because so many times in, uh, from a society and a public standpoint, we think that because someone does something that 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 is who that person is and that's not necessarily the case i mean it's not the case at all actually we want to know who they are as an individual so she's one person i'd like to interview in terms of things to do i don't know i don't know that i'm in physical shape to climb a mountain or anything of that nature so it wouldn't be that it may be to drive a get out on a speedway and drive a race car or something of that nature i'd like Ooh. to do that I, I drive fast you do yeah I, I so i'm in practice every day when i'm on the freeway <laughs> I'm working towards it, I guess. <laughs> but uh, awesome. And my company, I guess the last thing would be uh, my company. I would like to, for the next, uh, maybe over the next couple of years, I would certainly want Chris Howell Communications to be one of the top uh, marketing and communications firms uh, in the nation. I love that. That's, that's. I mean, you know, I'm working toward it. Write that one on the mirror there. Yeah, that you're right, there. absolutely right. I will right? do that because yeah. I have not done that. But that's uh, that's a goal of mine. I really want us to be one of the top uh, go-to companies when it comes to video production, uh, marketing, communications plans. Uh, we we'll certainly want to be considered in the top. So I'm going to ask you something. I only can go so deep with certain people, so I'm going to go really ultra deep on this last question. Okay. <laughs> um. Okay, in the last few years, it's something I've realized, um, and, it, and it took me a little while because I didn't really get it before, mm-hmm. and um, and I had to work at finding the relevance in my marriage, and I had to work at finding the happiness without looking outside, and I had mm-hmm. to work at overcoming the media implications of what our life is supposed to be, and I had to work to do that, you know what I'm saying? And, and it was a constant, constant work, 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 and then it got easier and easier, and it's interesting when my eyes weren't moving around, yeah. and when I wasn't focusing on the wrong, th- and I mean wrong things, meaning the wrong things. When I wasn't focusing on the wrong things, all of a sudden things got easier. Yeah. Do you feel that way? Do you feel that when you're actually doing what's right on every level that things seem to, seem to kind of make it, they, things seem to get easier? Because I think there's a lot of folks out there right now that are dealing with a negative, bad relationship. They mm-hmm. know that they don't need to be in that relationship. They know that they're better than that. They know that they need to find themselves. There's some folks out there that might not be giving their kids enough time, yeah. you know, um, you know, putting them in daycare or whatever they do to try to go find a man or to try to go find a woman whatever that is but it's when we finally focus our values back on family and doing what's right it seems like things kind of fall in place together let me say this and i i don't i can't say that i totally agree with what you're saying and i'll say it this way i used to be one who chased after this uh thing that we call life balance but i'm beginning to understand that i i in my belief chris howell's personal belief I don't believe there is such a thing as life balance. Mm -hmm. And I'll say because in what I try to do, rather than trying to balance out everything, because like I just told you a moment ago, I am really trying to build my company. But at the same time, I'm going to leave here in just a moment and I'm going to go and take my son to dinner because it's his birthday and we're going to have a family dinner. But every day I'm going to fall short somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of what day it is, what's going on in my life at that time on where I fall short. Today is my son's birthday, so I'm not going to be in the office tonight until 10 o'clock tonight. I'm going to uh, cut my day shorter. So I will fall short today Mm -hmm. from a business standpoint, but I will be doing what I need to do from a family standpoint tonight. Tomorrow, I will likely be in the office later because I I took off earlier today. Mm -hmm. So every day it's a balancing act to say, I'm going to fall short somewhere. Where is it? Will I fall short? What's the most important at this moment? Mm -hmm. So to me, that doesn't equate to a work life balance, because when I need to dig in and really go put it all into my business to go forward, I'm going to do that. When I need to take time off to spend time with my wife, time with my family, I'm going to do that. And one's going to take away from the other. That was probably a long way to say (laughs) that again, I I think if we really get out of our head and think, quit trying to chase this whole balance, uh, because I think you're setting yourself up for something that you can never really achieve because you're a business owner. Mm -hmm. You have clients that you have needs to take care of. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you may not be able to spend as much time with your husband that week because your clients are demanding more of you. Mm -hmm. Some weeks your clients are not demanding as much. So you have the time to spend with your husband. So it, it, it goes back and forth. 
And then on the flip side, then you have the spouse that's uh, too busy working. So then the times that you actually have a little bit of time off, they're at work. <laughs> Absolutely. You <laughs> no, know, so is. it's never a balance. It's it's you have to do what works best for you. I have the luxury of my wife who's now traveling. So she's gone four days a week. So I have the luxury of being able to dedicate time to the office. Mm. So when she's so that way, when she's home on the weekend, then I'm putting my time back into her. So it works out that way. Everyone doesn't have that type of luxury. So if you're trying to figure out where do I put my time, it really is what's demanding the most of your time and that particular day. And what's the most, really, it's more what's important. What's the most important? And if you dedicate your time and energy to what's the most important, then you're likely going to be falling short somewhere else. So you're really out of balance. Uh, I mean, that makes a lot of sense because a lot of us have, uh, we try to figure that out. We try to figure out that lifetime formula. Yeah. You know what and it really, there is no set formula. It works. It's what works best for you and your spouse and, and your family. Mm-hmm. One last word for, uh, one last thought for our uh, listeners, Chris. I guess the last thought would be, um, you know, living, live your true life purpose or perspective live your true life perspectives i need to get it right there the other p uh but it really again you're listening to this show because ashley does a dynamic job of bringing to you uh points and uh, and concepts that are really going to help you to move your life forward she has guests that help you to do the same thing my thing would be again quit comparing yourself to others understand where you are the cards that you've been dealt deal those cards move beyond the fear do whatever it is you've been called to do. You're perfected along the way. The final thought is I've heard someone once say that if you're not embarrassed by your first work, then that means you've started too late. If you're not embarrassed by your first work, you've started too late. So get started. Be embarrassed by your first work. You're perfected as you go. Wow, that's awesome. And Chris, I'm going to ask you one question. I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Are you willing yeah. to come back to the show and be on again? Absolutely, I am. Okay, we have you have we have you down for that. We're gonna have you sign an affidavit on the way out. So okay, we'll do. <laughs> I, I absolutely love that. And Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And I, uh, we, I know we've said something that's helped someone. I, mean, I know, I know you have. Uh, you have as well. I said we. I oh, I, me. I, I've tried. I've tried. I've tried. No, no, no most definitely. I love that last too. So yeah, go out there and, and look at your work. And I've, I've done that myself, and you've done that. That's great. Yeah. So stay true, live your true life, and remember that there is opportunity, there is motivation, it's all within you, and everything in this world is absolutely within you. Every goodness that you see is also part of you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for listening, and live your true life perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess. Be back this time, and be back this time in three shakes.